May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our I'm not really hearing the mic like this one is. No. Uh, Am I okay to keep... Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Brilliant. This is a good spot for folks who are online. Is anybody <laughs> online? Four of them. Hi, four of you. Good to see you. Good morning. My name is Prince Singh and I have the privilege of serving as the Bishop Provisional for Western and Eastern Michigan. I live Gotta get my map out. I live somewhere there, close to Big Rapids, in a little commu community called Canadian Lakes. It's about an hour and a half ish from here. And I'm so delighted to be here with all of you. I'm grateful for Susan. Susan, thank you for stepping in and playing. Yeah. That's very kind of you. And Everett, and I see Brian Coleman was sitting in the pews as well. I've heard so much about you. And I don't know what you know about me, but I used to be the Bishop of uh, Rochester, New York for about 14 years. So I'm familiar with this weather. <laughs> um, and I uh, have two sons. One of them is a sound engineer in Nashville, Tennessee, and the other is a senior in college. He will graduate this year, uh, this May, in a few weeks. Uh, he's training to be an actor. So, we'll be poor. <laughs> yeah, they both are passionate about their work. Um, just in case you're wondering if this is a midlife crisis, um, I don't think it is. I'm, I'm still doing this every year because my hair is still growing. And I've started uh, donating it to Wigs for Kids. It's one of the organizations that uses hair to create wigs for children who lose their hair because of cancer treatment. So that's what's going on. <laughs> um, I want to see if we can just pay a little bit of attention to one of the, I think, important themes of Holy Scripture, and especially the Gospels, where Jesus tries to give us a sense of what it means to be leaders. And in fact, every one of us who's called to be a disciple of Christ, who is following Christ, is called to be a leader. And by the way, when I was talking to Susan and Everett, they told me about Carter. Carter, I've heard about you. <laughs> Apparently you carry the cross with great panache. I am so looking forward to meeting you. Because that is the leader. Usually when you carry the cross, you're the first one to go in, right? And so I want to talk a little bit about leadership in the sense of what it means to be a leader who follows Jesus, right? And so there are some beautiful passages that we've been given today to consider. And I think each of them has at least one clue for me, in terms of what it means to be a leader who follows Jesus. And as I was praying about this morning, I was reminded of something very significant in terms of understanding leadership. And that is, in your name, Holy Trinity, right? We believe in a triune God. How many gods do we have? One. One. Good answer. Wow. I'm very impressed. One God. But we know God as a multiplicity within that unit. Right? When I was a young person and in India, I grew up in South India, in the church that I was attending, one of the things that my pastor, my priest did was to conduct a confirmation class for mostly young people who had Down syndrome. It was a beautiful movement called Faith and Light that I was part of. And this particular exercise was really significant 
for me in many ways. It has been very formative for me. In the course of the classes that we did, one of the exercises I remember was when he said, you know, gave us piece, uh, sheets of paper and said, draw something that depicts the Trinity. So all of us got very creative. My neighbor was Susan Mathai. She was about 21-ish and with Downs. And Susan had the most interesting depiction of the Trinity that I will never forget. She had basically one squiggly line. And when it came time to show and tell, she said, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Susan. <laughs> I've been to seminary. I've never heard a better explanation of the Trinity. Susan had placed herself in the communion of the Trinity. And I think that is the dream of God, that we would all commune and be a part of this unity that we know as the Trinity. It is the Holy Trinity because there is no conflict within. Why? Because it is held together in love. At the core of leadership, as a follower of Jesus, is a call for us to love. To love and love and love again. And so within this aspect of leadership, I want to raise up a few characteristics that stand out for me. The first one is, is really from our, our reading where in Peter, in 2 Peter, he talks about suffering. Suffering not because we messed up. We all do that, right? Suffering because we made a mistake and, and that sort of thing. But suffering when you have not made a mistake. I'd like to call it righteous suffering. When you didn't do anything wrong and yet you have a bad deal. And life is not fair, right? That sometimes things don't work out. That you're not really applauded for the right thing. That you actually bear a cross because you did something good. That is real. And when you feel alone, because usually you feel alone when that happens, right? When something went wrong, and when something continues to go wrong, even though you are trying your best to live a good life, to be a righteous person, that kind of suffering is what Peter is talking about. And when it does happen, that you hold on to your faith, that you do not become bitter. I took a lot of my lessons in life from my mother. She was a single mother who became a social worker and did a whole lot of things in her life that were pretty exemplary. One of the most significant things that I learned from her was her deep capacity to while she was going through things that were not fair, etc., she kept her faith. She did not flinch. She knew that God would never leave her. So I don't know where you are on your journey, but if you are feeling alone, but if you are feeling like life is not fair, that you are bearing a cross that is pretty ominous, know this, not everybody has that stewardship. And if you do, I hope you will carry your cross 
with dignity, gallantly, knowing that God was with you. If you look at the life of Jesus, there were times when he, he really suffered. If you read the Gospels again and again, there were times people were really mean to him. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. There was a time they were actually willing to throw him off the cliff because he said some things that irritated people. Right? Suffering is not by itself something that we should run away from. But that we can be stewards and leaders who can bear the cross and yet not lose their faith. The one thing that Jesus does promise us is that God is with us. God does not promise that everything will be fine, that everything will be rosy. God does promise God's presence. About two years ago, almost two years ago, I was <coughs> in Rochester and I was, it was a, a pretty nice day and I had just come back home. I was on a Zoom call. It was about 12-ish in the afternoon. I heard some crackling noise. I paused my Zoom meeting and ran to see what was going on, I opened the door out, it was completely on fire, and the, my car had self-exploded or something happened. And it took me just a second to realize this is, this is not good. So I ran, picked up my phone, called 911, ran outside. By the time the neighbors came, there were seven fire engines and the house was destroyed. If that had happened at 12 o'clock at night, I would have been right on top of that fire. I am standing here as a witness before you, having come through a fire. It's just a small smidget of an example. Yeah, I lost everything. But I'm still alive. I still got my faith. I don't know what your fire is. Hold on. Hold on because God is with you. And things will get better. That's the only assurance we have. At the end of the day, as long as God is walking with us, in and through our suffering, we can be witnesses to the fact that God walks with us. And that's a witness to leadership. Are you following what I'm saying? As long as we can be faithful. The second example that I want to lift up to you is from Acts of the Apostles. Where the disciples, the early disciples, were people who actually shared when anybody had a need. It was a beautiful church. It was a church that came out of the crucible of suffering. They knew fear. They knew how it felt to be marginalized. And yet they learned through that experience of suffering that when I suffer, somebody else can feel it. Somebody else can be present. Somebody else can resonate with love. And so they learn to be unselfish. Imagine that. Imagine a world where we can all learn to be unselfish in our love. I, I think I'm preaching to the choir because you know a thing or two about being unselfish. I've heard about your baby closet. I've heard about your, you know, clarity about sharing your way of leading, for instance. That is unselfish. Learning to be unselfish is really probably the most significant lesson 
that we can learn from Jesus. Because he was unselfish. And he teaches us to love unselfishly. So my beloved, as our forebears who were Christians, striving to follow Jesus, learned to be unselfish, we too can be unselfish. Maybe slowly, but surely, maybe step by step by step by step, we can. And as long as we are in communion with the Trinity, like Susan reminded us, we may be able to move in that direction because that's the model that we get from our Holy Trinity. But finally, I want to also lift up another aspect of leadership and that is character. We are told in this beautiful passage from Luke about how Jesus is considered a good shepherd. Good shepherd. Shepherd, by the way, is another way of saying leader. Because shepherds lead. Right? That's one of the reasons I carry a crozier or, or a staff. It's just to remind me and us that we are not without leadership. Not that the bishop is the one who leads. But it's a model of leadership. Do you see what I'm saying? You are leaders, so I'm preaching to the choir. Right? I know a little bit about what it means for a congregation that is figuring things out, even without a rector. Right? About how to lead. Because that means you are people who can dig deep and answer the question, how can we take care of this body of Christ? And that's why character is important. Character means there's integrity. Character means that we are able to offer the best we can. As some wise person has said, has said character is what you do when no one is looking. It's not for the cameras. It's a thing of the heart. It's a thing about integrity. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus, the good shepherd, tells us that he is not like a hired hand who comes in to steal or to exploit, but comes to actually make things better, more beautiful, more safe, more fruitful. That's what character does. And when you look at leaders out there, in the world, if that benchmark is not met, there's a problem. Because without character, we will sell our souls. Right? Whether it's young children or adults, it's the same thing. We are called in that sense of the word to follow the good shepherd because that's an example of character. And character does not let us down. It may have calls for us to do some tough things, but it comes from a place of integrity. That's why I think this gospel or the gospel community called the church is still around. There are many parts of the world where a Sunday morning like this is unimaginable. Do you know why? Because it's dangerous to worship God. It's dangerous to follow Jesus. I'm talking about the country that I grew up, for instance, where there are forces that come and intimidate Christians who just gather to worship. It's very common to read about churches being set on fire. All because some of the forces within that context 
don't want people to follow this Jesus. Persecution is very real in many parts of the world. But the thing that really stands out to me every time I hear a story like that is that people of faith who follow this Jesus hold on to their integrity. Hold on to their faith. I've seen it time and time again. And these are not big, you know, heroes that we describe. These are ordinary people with deep and in deep integrity and an extraordinary faith. So my friends, when we consider character and when we consider leadership, let us keep in mind that the model that Jesus sets for us is that we guard our souls. And only you can do that by yourself within the privacy of your heart. To meditate on scripture, to pray with that deep sense of wanting to be like God. And as I started this sermon, Susan reminds me, God the Father 